not a time for them to sit down. For regular board meeting of December 14th to order. If you'll all please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. segue into just the overall kind of culture itself. I think overall for scheduling and just overall regulations, they've stayed pretty much consistent since the last few times um, I visited here. Um, so nothing too different about that, but it's all, but it's just like looking at like how students are interacting with their school environment and with their teachers. And like, even in some of my classes, we've addressed like how, especially the underclassmen, how they are trying to like build up a relationship with teachers and teachers are you know pushing out surveys saying you know like what can we do to be a resource for you or what can we do so that you know we're having a better um, connection with the students because it seems to be kind of a block and it seems to be very different as opposed to other years and I was just discussing with Sylvia and Formo back there that like it's it's something that we're trying to figure out but we don't know what it is yet with the students um, I know like this generation is it's a lot more short fuse now because we've had virtual learning like we were used to that quick content like now we're we're not used to being in person we're not used to having to have our focus on one person for 40 minutes to an hour and so we're kind of trying to fix that and trying to figure out ways that we can handle that better and I think um, teachers are trying to get more student input on how they can be a better resource um, also with that there is also been a protest at South, I know particularly about um, sexual harassment and sexual assault. Um, students have protested um, on student comfort and how schools, um, especially South, has handled sexual assault victims and the perpetrators of the sexual harassment. And so there's been protests that have happened. I know Monday it happened during lunch and then it went throughout the school day and then Tuesday it, it reoccurred today. And so I'm in full support of it, but I just wanted to bring aware to that so that you are all in the know. Um, students, um, especially female students, are not feeling comfortable within their school. They're not feeling that their issues are being resolved properly or that they're just being pushed to the side. And so the protest is really about bringing up those issues of sexual harassment or even if it's like the smallest, maybe smallest micro harassment, but that it's brought up to attention and handled properly. And it also may um, touch into other areas like um, dress code or just inappropriate comments that are made to students and like how we can address that better. So there's been protests about that. Um, I'm trying to get more information on how they're gonna continue on and how they're gonna keep the momentum, but I just wanted to bring that to attention. Um, along with another group, we have We Rise. We got to meet with uh, Lieutenant Governor Mandela Barnes, which is really exciting. Um, that happened a while back, now thinking about it. But he was so fun to have. We got to ask him a lot of questions, like you know, his journey through politics or what he thought about our group and how we can continue to keep going with our work. And so that was really exciting. And then we got to take a picture with him and I got to stand right next to him and <laughs> woo! Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> so that was really fun because we, we got to meet up with him again and I think it was a really good connection with the group. Like we we're all sitting there listening to him talk and it was, it was a very fun moment. So that was exciting. Um, with extracurriculars, there's not many highlights. A lot of them, again, were addressed in the previous meeting, but we just finished our season. Um, I know SWIM had a good highlights with their um, contesters, and then gymnastics had a close, and now we're starting up with our winter season, so that's exciting. For cheer, personally, we got to do our qualifiers. Unfortunately, it had to be virtual, so we had we got to go to the high school, and but we had to film it as opposed to having the judges there, so our results don't get told until the 19th. Hopefully we qualify, but you know, things may happen. Um, the musical happened. I don't know if any of y'all got to see it, but it was very fun and it was 
very well done. I enjoyed it a lot. They presented at South on the 9th of November. And no freshman watch, but it was sophomores, juniors, and seniors that got to be in the audience. And we just had such a fun time. The actors and actresses were so good. And I think it shows like how the district really handles the talent of North and South. It was a yes. very, very fun thing to see. And there's a lot of student participation, which I was very shocked about, because like, you know, post-COVID, it's like we've kind of lacked that involvement, but there is so much with the stage crew, the setting up, and then the overall performance, which was so much fun. Um, we had parent-teacher conferences, not much about that. Um, and then for advisory, we're working on a lot of career prep, and we did um, that district youth survey, I think that required one. That took forever, but I got it done. <laughs> um, <laughs> But we looked at different things like, you know, focusing on if you're trying to go into this career, what classes you should take, how you should align with that. Um, we worked on how to be more professional with emailing because you can't just email a teacher, hey, what's up? You know, it's there's proper etiquette to that. So all these little things that are we are trying to be nitpicky with. Um, and also junior career prep. We took the pre-ACT, but it wasn't just juniors. It was freshmen, sophomores, and juniors that took that. Um, and that was enjoyable, very fun, had a good time with that, but, and we're also focusing on attendance, so with that we and our advisories are doing what's called a holiday blitz, so every advisory is like a team and it's like a bracket, so whatever advisory has the best attendance is going to move up in the bracket. Um, shocked to say that my advisory did get out the first round, <laughs> very disappointing because I'm competitive, but I think it's helping pushing students to just make it to your classes, you know, try to be on time, you know, fix your attendance because I know for the North and South game, we're really trying to crack down on attendance and time owed and getting students to say like, even if it's a mistake, make sure you get up and talk to your teachers about getting your attendance fixed because that is a big issue. And also with South's life, I'm gonna try to keep it together, but um, Kalik Mack was shot and murdered and, um, oh, no, 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 okay. Uh, not many people know this, but I've known Kalik since elementary school and throughout middle school, and he's been like a brother to me, so losing him was not easy um, and very shocking, compiled with Monse's death in the beginning of the school year. Um, but I think it really helped because um, the school pushed um, to make sure that students who are grieving with that or having a hard time with that were being acknowledged and had resources to help. And we also raised $3,000 for his family, which was amazing. Um, mm -hmm. I remember telling my parents, I was like, I have a lot of money saved up so I can donate. Um, but it was, a, it was a nice way to honor him. And I know a lot of groups got together to make pins for him to help with his memorial. So that was really amazing to see. Um, also, I think it, it helps me segue into like counseling resources for students. I think the counseling center did really good at pushing like, if you need time, please let us know. I know there are some days when I just emotionally could not, you know, and so I was able to, you know, go talk to my counselor, have a room to myself to just reconvene and do my schoolwork, and I really appreciated that, and I think we need to continue with that, because, you know, a lot of students are in an emotional state, you know, they don't know how to express their emotions as well, and even I struggle with that, so to have that back, you know, to have that backed up with like, hey, you know, come down, take some time, talk to someone, that was really helpful, and so I really appreciated that. Oh, sorry to end on a sad note, but that is my conclusion. If you have any questions, do feel free to ask. I just wanted to know, I just wanted to know, I appreciate you bringing up all of the past of the report, but in particular, uh, bringing up the, the assault students reaching out. I believe, and Mr. Farmelow is here, and you'll correct me if I'm wrong, you met with those students <laughs> once and had a discussion, There's yes. going to be, and there'll be a follow-up discussion happening with Mr. Farmelow, so I'm hopeful that that dialogue can continue so that those students can communicate exactly what's on their minds, what concerns that they've got, um, the resources that are there in place. Um, and so I'll 
couldn't have said it better myself, so I won't. <laughs> I, I don't know if this is the proper time to hear, but if those these protests and the topic of this are very, very concerning, and I expect some kind of explanation from the administration. But what you said was so generic, I don't even really know what the problem is. Is this sexual assaults that are occurring in the school? Are these people that have alleged incidents or actual incidents outside of school and how they're act interacting in school? I have no idea what's got everybody all fired up. Was it one thing? Is this an overwhelming, continuous thing? Or what, you know, what exactly is this concern? And I'd like to have a better idea of what that is. I think the concern centers around just sexual assault in general and how it's, it, so how it deals with the school environment. So a lot of students, they are students, so a lot of their stories come from in classes of getting maybe remarks about what they're wearing or teachers saying inappropriate things to them. Um, I'm not going to bring up any like particular names because I don't think it's my right to bring no, up those stories. But fine, I just have, have an idea of, yeah, I, I mean, just about how schools and districts can better handle when students bring up issues centering around sexual assault or sexual harassment. So well, there the, wasn't a specific incident that occurred. The, oh, of course there's specific the incidents, but I think just to keep it more vague because it is a bigger issue as opposed to needling it on one thing, the whole thing is just figuring out how schools and the administration can be a better service to students who need to report sexual assaults well, and sexual harassment. I appreciate where I'm coming from because obviously you get everybody's fired up and wants to take action. They right. obviously know a heck of a lot of information, more information of what's going on to get them fired up to want to take some kind of action. And it, it, we really kind of feel left out as board members that we don't have a clue as to what's going on or what these concerns even are. Yep, and, and then that's... It's just very generic at this yeah. point. Well, that's why I, I that's, that's my job that, to that, report that, that to you then. Yeah, no, it is. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm not asking you to give me more now. Yeah. But oh, absolutely. It, but it's, and that's why Mr. Formolo is, is working with those students to find out those specifics. Mm -hmm. uh, what is happening, not happening, whatever. And we'll keep that is that's, that's sexual that is. assault that happened and no action was taken or <coughs> exactly yes it centers on that issues as well and like again the group is just getting momentum so there's did it occur you know. at the school hmm? did it occur at the school I can, if I can jump in one of the things that uh, as Kevin's working with and the school team at Pets Health is working with uh, a specific incident at a school was not the the dialogue that, that Kevin had it was more the generalities, talking, as, as Calista mentioned, around student dress, about feelings, about how to respond, and when I have a concern, how does that be addressed? Uh, many of the challenges that our kids face, not only at school, but we've talked about it in some of the previous things around social media and the use of social media, uh, appropriately or inappropriately, and where does that involvement of the school rest when it's off campus versus at night and weekends versus during the day, and if something would, were to occur off campus, but yet I have to see that person in my class, and where is that responsibility of school versus the, the community? So it's those types of things, but there wasn't a one singular, like this is a big issue that was left unresolved. It's really about how to build awareness, and that was what the group was, uh, was going. Kevin, if there's anything else you'd like to add to that. Yeah, I think, it had, I mean, it's, it's multiple layers to it. There's not a specific case that happened this year, but just the overall feeling of that when a student makes a report of sexual assault, whether it be uh, in the community, that the perpetrator has rights to still attend school. So there's a lot of, you know, there's a, decisions that are being made by the police department, the re reports, and then the courts that we as a school still have to offer free and appropriate education so that if that person who committed that act against another person, they're going to be in the school, they're going to see, that victim is going to see that person. Um, so that's really where a lot of it is and helping kind of clear that up. And then the secondary piece is just wanting to look again at our dress code, which has been a national trend now, feels like for 10 years of just, where are we in dress code not feeling like it's singling out females for, uh, about females for their dress and how that might impact the thinking of their male counterparts, for example, um, and just how that uh, expectation in the schools is being uh, implemented where students are feeling like it might be implemented with bias. So those are the two big areas that we're going to continue to explore. The students are going to help us, that group of students are going to help us put together a, an additional um, sexual assault dating relationships 
curriculum type presentation that we can do through our advisories, um, introducing all the avenues that kids can take. And then secondly, we'll be opening up a discussion with our students on dress code and how we redefine, uh, move that line again. It seems like we're moving that dress code line every two to three years based on the trends and what you can actually buy in a clothing store. So those are the, 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 the specifics, but at this point there hasn't been a specific reported case that says here's where South High Avenue went wrong. So it's a general feeling uh, from this group that students who are victims of sex assault um, are not being, uh, are, their, their needs are uh, having a higher hierarchy than that of the perpetrator in terms of the school setting. If that helps clarify it. But more to explore with the kids and we'll see what else comes up through private conversations with kids want to fill out uh, sexual assault or harassment uh, forms for the district so we can continue to investigate where specific cases may have come up. <coughs> One of the things that, uh, thank you, Kevin, for yes, your sure. excellent work in, in terms of meeting with that group prior to their their uh, wanting to, you know, engage in their in their uh, demonstration and, and work through that, but then also to follow up and on those. And uh, I think Felicity made it. I know how does that group maintain some continued dialogue and momentum and, and to address concerns that are having. We are seeing this occur, and I put that in the communication I shared with the board. We are seeing this occur in other school districts, Wauwatosa being uh, a, a, another example where a similar group of students uh, conducted themselves in the exact same manner, saying that and they had to walk out, and that was in a, the Milwaukee Journal, for example, that, that article. Um, and so we're seeing that, that trend. I've talked with our county superintendents, and dress code um, is coming up in other districts as well in terms of that notion about, uh, as Kevin mentioned, you know, about what we talk about a dress code in relationship to females versus males and uh, that notion of what's what's uh, a distraction versus what's a non-distraction. Um, so we are seeing, seeing that and uh, we want people to come forward and provide services. We want to investigate if there's concerns and uh, we want people to feel that it's a safe, welcoming place at all of our schools. And uh, uh, this is a group with, that wants to address and have conversations around that. So. At, uh, there's about 40 students or so on yesterday and about 25 today. So are these students marked as absent or how is, how is that addressed? If the students are, are uh, have left class um, and are uh, they are not communicated with, their parents have not communicated with, they'd be marked absent like other students. Um, and if there is uh, communication, we would deal with it in that. So we, you know, we don't prohibit kids from doing you know, walkouts or protests, we don't encourage it either. We're, we're more neutral, but we do take the same disciplinary, uh, consequential, if you will, not disciplinary per se, but consequential basis for student absences as any other student. Okay, any other questions for Melissa? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Sophia. All right, hello, board members. <coughs> I'm very grateful for the opportunity to share a little bit about North, the culture surrounding there. Um, the, roughly the past four months of being back, and more specifically the past month or two, I would say. <clears throat> um, as much as I love sharing about the athletics, academics, um, and student life, I'd like to gear our conversation a little bit more towards also what Clissa talked about, kind of the student culture at North High. Um, we'll try to adjust to what we call the new normal. Um, We've definitely faced lots of issues. Um, to name a few, we've had excess bathroom graffiti, um, just kind of some general disrespect toward other peers and teachers, as well as problems with social media platforms and just sharing false and um, disrespectful information. So in addition to some of the issues that North is facing, there is also not really an in-between um, I've noticed that like lots of students are either very involved in North and attend lots of events and um, <clears throat> are very involved in clubs and activities and then there's another group of students who maybe aren't as involved, um, don't take school maybe as seriously or kind of are struggling to get involved. So um, there's not quite, there's a very large divide I would say this year that I haven't seen in past years. <clears throat> So while well, facing like lots of these problems that I personally see as a student and I know other students that I've talked to have seen similar things, um, I just kind of ask myself like why are students maybe feeling the way that they are or why they're doing these actions. 
Um, and my first thoughts are, well, some students have been in their homes the past year and a half, and I think that just lack of social communication and interaction can really cause students to have anxiety when coming back to that because they're not used to being around peers and communicating face to face with other teachers. And um, I mean, even personally coming back to school, like for the first time after I was home, it was nerve wracking just because I wasn't used to being back in the school environment and the stamina wasn't there. So I think, I mean, if I'm a senior and struggling with that, I can only imagine like freshmen and sophomores who haven't had like that full transition period from middle school to high school where they're in the classroom setting and they really get to know their teachers. So these are big changes and I'm not sure all students were mentally prepared for that change, um, which could be part of the reason we're seeing some of these issues. Um, also, I know lots of family dynamics changed over the pandemic, so I think that can be a big adjustment to students. They're not only worried about school, but then they think back to their home environments. Um, and I know lots, which th these things can all lead to insecurities. I know even some of the, like, the best students and students who are secure in their homes, they still struggle with insecurities. And I think I'm seeing that a lot more this year than I've ever seen in past years at North High School. Um, so there's just like this feeling that's a little bit off. And Calissa, we were kind of talking about that and just can't quite pinpoint what it is. I know I feel it and I'm just trying to ask myself, like, is there a solution? But I also know that, like, these issues, they just are time. And, like, patience is key in trying to figure out kind of why students are feeling this way. Um, and staff and faculty and even students, they're working so hard this year. And I give so much credit to all my teachers because I see how hard they're working in the classroom. Um, but at the same time, like, I see if students need somebody to talk to, they can go to their teachers because teachers are so willing to talk, but they also <coughs> have their lives. So I think maybe finding that one person in the school that we can communicate to students, hey, this is where you can go if you need that person to talk to. And I think they have done that with like counselors and stuff, but counselors also have big responsibilities with getting students ready for their next step in life after high school. And I think just maybe that's one possibility. I'm not sure what that looks like exactly. Um, but also a bigger focus of mine um, is just that I want to shift the gear at North and just trying to focus on the positives and just a positive way to bring people together. So I think the support sometimes is lacking a little bit, um, just like with peers um, especially. So I think there, it can't be blamed on someone why students are facing this, but um, my two biggest kind of like open-ended questions are just how can we move forward and as a team, as a school, as a community, and um, how can we get to the bottom of why students might be facing some of the issues that we're seeing at North this year? Um, and that I don't know exactly the answer to, but it's just kind of some questions I've been thinking, I know others have been thinking. Um, so yeah, those are just two thoughts, but then on a positive note, um, there are so many great things happening at North with sports and other athletics. I know Student Council just had their annual holiday breakfast on Saturday, which was a super big success. Um, it felt so good to give back to the community, um, seeing all the little kids sit on Santa's lap. It was so fun. Um, but yeah, so with all the mix of joys, plus um, some of the negatives that we're seeing at North, just kind of finding ways to um, really kind of get to the bottom of why students might feel the way they feel and just um, work around maybe some of the anxiety that's going on at North High School. So um, thank you for listening to me. And even though it's my senior year, I really want to make sure to like leave North High as a school that's known for its respect, its ownership, and engagement. So thank you so much. I'm happy to answer any questions. You know, I think I work at Lakeland, and yeah. the, some of the same exact issues that are happening at North and South are happening with Lakeland students too because you're reacclimating to it's really not the new normal right it's the old normal but yeah. it's it's what's old is new again kind exactly. of thing right yeah and you have to readjust for sure and we have two classes of students who have yet to have a traditional college experience mm -hmm. because exactly. of the pandemic so they're on a third year of okay now is this going to be normal and I don't know what normal is and and it's, so I, I, I bringing yeah. that up, the, the message I guess is it's not just North, it's not yeah. just South. I, I think if you have schools, high schools, middle schools, all over the state, all over the country, higher education, it, it's not 
it's not just a north thing, yeah. it's not just a south thing, it's a much bigger thing, but I think it's a community sure. thing too. Yeah. You know, some of the angst that you're talking about, some of the division that you're talking mm -hmm. about, we're seeing that you know, on a community level, we're seeing it on a statewide level. So I think it's trickled into the schools. Um, so I think once we figure out how to solve it on that broader level, yeah. and if you guys, you know, if you two put your heads together and figure out how to solve it, it wouldn't surprise me if you did that. So, Santino. Oh, uh, thanks, David. Um, Sylvia, thank yeah. you for your your report as well as your charisma. Um, so dealing with behaviors in the school, right? Is this do you? This is going to be a multiple, multi-level yeah. question. Um, is it the younger um, student population versus the old? Um, yeah, I well personally at North, I definitely think it's the freshmen and sophomores. Partic I mean, it happens in all grades. It's kind of looked at on a scale. Um, the most problems have probably been within our sophomore class. Um, why exactly? I think kind of some of the reasons with the pandemic like we've talked about. Um, but I would definitely say it's geared towards the younger, the underclassmen. <coughs> From what I've noticed, the upperclassmen at least have had some experience and some exposure to the years prior to COVID. So I think that's what we're primarily seeing at North. Yeah, it's the same thing here because like our seniors are the only ones who have actually, so like we have FlexMod at our school, and so our seniors are the only ones who have actually dealt with that the entire year and have dealt with like the constantly changing classes and teachers and stuff. <laughs> and like, like my grade for juniors, we've had that for a little bit, but it cut short because of COVID. And so like, it's hard to then go in, like go completely from a different scheduling and get used to that and then like having this commitment like, oh, I, do I have to go to this class that's only 15, like 20 minutes today or something like that. So it's definitely with the underclassmen, like we've had to fix a lot of how we do our self life around, centered around them and keeping them geared together. Um, so it's more definitely an underclassmen issue because they've missed those years of high school development or even late middle school development too. Which comes to my question, how um, as an administration can they support um, the upperclassmen to be um, like mentors to the younger classes coming up uh, because you guys seen it you guys been through it you more mature um, how do you feel that you can be helped to empower yourselves to help these individuals coming alongside of you to show them hey this is like you said it's not the new norm but how do you persevere through this to be the next class that steps up to keep keeping that cycle moving into a positive direction Good question. That is such a great question, and that's actually what um, I was just talking about with Mr. Machek today. Like, what can we do? You know, like, there's all these issues, but it's I think it's something that is might just take time and patience with just kind of trying to like dig in a little bit deeper with some of these students that might be struggling. And I mean, that's a great. I'm wondering the same thing for as a student. You know, and I think like yeah. I'm sorry. No, no. I, I agree too. And like I think my my always my first idea is like involvement. Like when I have younger people like in like student council and stuff, I'm able to connect with them through something that they also like, so it doesn't feel too forced with them. And I'm like, hey, you want to work on this together? And so I think they look up to us in those certain aspects. It's so like pushing for like, hey, if you're interested in this, do it. And like upperclassmen, I think, would really love to maybe like form some groups of students where they can just exist, you know, without expectations and just be around their peers. But, you know, my big thing is involvement, but also what Sylvia said, like, it's hard to pinpoint one exact thing to like push on them. And like, it's, it's just going to take time again to just get used to your surroundings and just try to have back some sort of high school experience as well. Mm -hmm. But I Thank think, you. you know, mentoring is, is and Kevin and John will kick me up. I'm speaking out of turn, but just mentor. Yeah. You don't have to wait for anybody to yeah. give you a blessing and say, oh, okay, we're going to have a mentorship program now. Just do it. Yeah. Just to, and, it, and you two clearly are leaders in your school. You know the other leaders <coughs> in your school. Mm -hmm. You guys can empower. You're already empowered. And just empower yourselves. You're already there. Just, just do it. I mean, you know what to do. I, 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 I think you know what to do, you know? And, and you don't have to wait for Mr. Machek or Mr. Formal to tell you what to do. You know, they can help you. Like, like Santino suggested, they can create some 
avenues, pathways, open some doorways, but but you've got that ability already inside of you. They're not going to suddenly instill that in you. It's already there. Just do it. Any other questions? Thank you, Paul. I, I was wondering if North has the same uh, concerns with the sexual assault and the sexual harassment going on there. Is there going to be student activism there also? Yeah, I, so personally, I don't know anybody that did the walkout, um, but there was stuff posted on social media pages advertising for the walkout. So I wasn't as informed on the subject, so I didn't want to bring it up because I don't have a lot of background on it. But there, I definitely saw stuff being posted. Um, are you aware of any specific incidents that are occurring at North? I, I was not. I'm not aware, but I'm sure there has been. I, I thought I could keep this to myself, but I just can't. So <laughs> I was driving by on South uh, Business in Washington when this happened the first day. And the, the mom slash grandma in me was traumatized by those kids standing out in the median. So if you can take it back to school and maybe you... Calissa and Kevin, and just say, I, I'm i a child of the 60s. I protested myself from here to kingdom come. But <laughs> but if they could stay on the sidewalk, if all we need is one kid getting pushed by somebody else into traffic, that's such a busy corner. I mean, it made all the hair on my arms stand up when I realized that some well-intentioned person could hurt, somebody could get hurt. So it's a it's an important part of America to be able to express yourself and to have protests be a part of, of how we function in our society, but not in the median and a really busy intersection because if, if somebody gets hurt, that would just be really, really sad. We don't, we don't need any more kids getting hurt or loss of life. So. You should conclude it in the weekends, too. My kids say I'm overprotective. So. Mm -hmm. The message that would be heard a lot louder. Mm -hmm. I, I just want to take a moment and really thank both of you for the, the candor and the insight. It's difficult at any age to talk about uncomfortable things, pressing things, tense things with anyone in the position of authority. It's extremely impressive to do it as seniors and juniors in high school. Um, we don't have an ability to address our these conversations without that honesty and candor um, that allows us to do a better job. And ultimately, the whole purpose of why we're in this room is to figure out what you need to succeed and what your, your peers need to succeed. Um, and it was, it's very, very helpful. We're not in the, the buildings day to day to know if there's kind of a mood of, of melancholy, maybe perhaps is the right way to describe that. I don't know if it's else, but um, just thank you. Uh, thank you for doing that. Continue to, to keep that honesty and bring that to us. I know it can be intimidating. Um, I hope it's not, uh, but it, it always can be. Um, and continue to lead, uh, you know, um, as, as Dave said, I think the most um, powerful thing you can do in terms of impacting that culture is inspiring your peers, self-mentor, and, and, and build that. But there's clearly work that we have to do together to support it. But mostly, I just wanted to say thank you for having the courage and the spirit and um, <coughs> the willingness to speak truth to power. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Anything else? Hang in there, the rest of the break. Break his knee. Yes. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Happy holidays. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you, Thank you for having us. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Okay, we'll move on to item seven community input. Anyone here tonight who would care to address the board? Anyone here tonight who would care to address the board? Okay. We have um, online, we have uh, one individual online. I'm not okay. sure if they want to address the board, but if they would like to raise their hand, it's star nine. Online person? I am not seeing their hand okay. go up, so I just wanted to make sure to be paused yeah, to give them you. an opportunity. No, I appreciate that. Okay, we will move. To item eight, which is the report. Yeah. Uh, good evening again, and uh, uh, glad to be here this evening to, to engage that and the leadership. I, I was going to echo that, so thank you, Kyle, about this the leadership and willingness to, to bring forward uh, issues and, and discussions and talk about possibilities. 
Um, today we uh, had uh, partnered with uh, Purveya Health to offer a COVID-19 on-site vaccination clinic for students five and up. Uh, the clinic was held at Wilson Elementary School um, between there was 3 and 7 p.m. Uh, pa parents had to pre-register, uh, but they also did accept walk-ins. Uh, when I was there about 4 o'clock today, uh, with pre-registration, they were expecting um, around 50 individuals uh, to, to uh, the, who had signed up, uh, plus their walk-ins they've had already. So uh, we'll know uh, more tomorrow. Again, it was completely voluntary. It's, it's nothing that uh, we require. Uh, we are just uh, trying to provide an, a conduit for those who are seeking opportunities and trying to remove some barriers for families. Uh, they will be back at that same location uh, the week uh, when we return after the winter break that first week in January on the 4th for their second dose. Uh, no charge um, uh, for that uh, to our families. Um, we were awarded, the district was, and thanks to uh, Meredith and her team within um, Nutritional Services, uh, $118,000 for the 21-22 Fresh Fruit and Vegetable Program. Uh, program promotes fresh fruits and vegetables, obviously, uh, that are healthy snack <coughs> options for students. It helps them to develop lifelong healthy eating habits. Um, it's funded by the U.S. Department of Agriculture and administered uh, through the Department of Public Instruction. So again, uh, additional resources to support our, our students in, in healthy eating. Uh, uh, months ago, we came to the board through the SPEF uh, Foundation and a group that would like to uh, re uh, recognize uh, Tom Desitel for the, the naming rights of the Acuity Fieldhouse main floor. And so Friday night was the ceremony. I don't, if you saw the spread that was in the um, Sunday paper, uh, they had a uh, um, fabulous pictures. Uh, they had a program uh, during the game on Friday night, former students, uh, and uh, Tom was able to speak as, as well. Uh, Dan Stengel and his team uh, helped facilitate that along with our Sheboygan Public Education Foundation. Uh, one of the things that uh, he coached the boys basketball again for 39 years at uh, North High and during those 39 years had 646 wins, which is the third most in state history but, and most by any Division I uh, coach in the history of uh, WIA in Wisconsin. 17 conference titles, 24 WIA regional championships, and obviously led the Golden Raiders to WIA state tournament championship, uh, but led them to tournament uh, seven times, uh, title winner in 86. Um, they beat out Lincoln High School in Manitowoc when I was attending there to be going to state. Um, uh, so that was a, <clears throat> but I'm happy for that now being here in Sheboygan. And they were runners up in 93. Uh, again, pictures in the write up was, was in the press. And uh, again, uh, thank that group of former players. Um, and there's actually a picture that they took in the Desitel gym of former players with the coach and, and so forth. So uh, again, uh, congratulations for that and the, the foundational gift to make that happen will help support other programming across the district through the SPEF Foundation. Um, the third installment you should have received of uh, the SASD email newsletter. Uh, every month we're trying to capture and highlight a variety of, of uh, activities going across the district, uh, typically from each of our levels to help people understand. Again, part of our goal to work, and you're going to hear a little <coughs> more of uh, our goal report uh, later on in the agenda. Uh, but there was information about the state report card in there. There was information about Red Raider manufacturing, a student spotlight. There was information about horse man students that performed a, a uh, food truck uh, as part of the um, Family Consumer Sciences with their food truck showcase. So again, I thank Sarah and Nicole for putting together and working with our schools on, on getting information out to our families. We've gotten some very positive comments from uh, families, and we've got people asking, how do I get signed up for that? Um, as well. Uh, so we're very excited about that. And last but not least, I just want to recognize the fact that uh, this will be our final uh, Board of Education meeting held here at the central, what's now referred to as central support uh, and the central building uh, as we will be making a shift in January to the administrative uh, services building. Uh, and so it's, it's a little eerie to come back here as we're setting up and getting things organized for tonight's meeting, when uh, the second floor here and the third floor here, and some of our community rec and our uh, maintenance uh, electronics group, it, we're all out at the new building and things are going well there. Uh, we will be 
um, having an open house um, to the public. Um, and we are scheduling that for the night of the uh, January 25th, which is the full board meeting. We know the committee meetings can be a little, you know, difficult and more people are interested in the full board meetings. We really felt that that was, uh, uh, would be a more appropriate setting. So we'll be getting some information together and being sent out saying that uh, prior to the board meeting that we welcome people who would like to tour the building and then also um, stay for the board meeting, of course, for the highlight of the night. So uh, we'll be uh, uh, communicating that out as we go uh, over the next few weeks here, especially after the holiday season. So uh, again, uh, uh, we're excited and the, the new building's been working well, um, but it, uh, this will be our last official board meeting in this room. That's the end of my report. So for uh, next month when we have our committee meetings, please tell me that we're going to get a map or at least an arrow saying where we're going to be meeting for the committee meetings. Yes, um, we, we, will have, uh, we, we do have a signage that yeah. indicates the rooms and uh, we're going to have consistent rooms. So once you learn how to, how to get there and uh, we will be working through that and we'll have staff to help, especially yeah. those first couple of committee meetings uh, to get you there and uh, back. So. Yeah. I get lost easily, so yeah. I appreciate that. <laughs> Perhaps just a reminder on uh, January that we'll be there asking for a friend. Not that I'm in the building. Not that you would not show up at the right spot asking yeah. for a friend. So yeah. uh, we will certainly send reminders as part of our uh, regular meeting uh, notices. Uh, it will also be posted again on our website and so forth as, as we do. So. I say that because an agenda setting staff was already at the <laughs> and I said, no, I'll see you there in person, and I drove right here. We're doing at the office. So. <laughs> so we'll make sure that that, that occurs. Anything else, Prasad? That might have been the most productive agenda so you've had. Okay, I'll move on to miscellaneous item A, the 20, 20, 2021 audit report. Mark, Wendy, and Brian. Well, I'm Brian Grunewald with Cliff and Arsenal. Thank you for having me here this evening. Um, I just uh, have a few highlights with regards to the district's financial condition and the results of their audit. Uh, before I get to that, I do want to thank Wendy and Mark for the cooperation and assistance that we receive uh, throughout the audit process. Your team puts in a lot of effort preparing for the audit, um, responding to requests, working with us throughout that process. So just want to say thank you for that cooperation and effort. In terms of the audit documents, we do have the um, audited financial statements, as well as we do also issue a separate letter. I'm gonna to refer to that as executive summary. Um, in terms of the discussion tonight, I've just taken some information from both of those documents and just summarized it within the context of this PowerPoint. But if you have questions on any of the documents, please feel free to, uh, to ask. I just wanted to start out briefly and I wanted to remind everyone of the responsibilities with regards to the audit and the audit process. Uh, from management's perspective, management is responsible for the financial statements. Management is also responsible for their, their internal control environment. Uh, that means essentially looking at how things are done, financial policies and procedures, uh, accounting for specific uh, transactions. That's all part of management's responsibility. Our responsibility is to express an opinion on your financial statements. In order to do that, we perform tests, uh, audit tests, and procedures to support our audit opinion. Uh, we certainly consider things like accounting policies, accounting estimates, and we also consider the organization's internal control structure. We do not issue an opinion on your internal control structure. to provide a summary of the audit results, we actually issue multiple different reports that are all included in your financial statements. The first being the auditor's report on the basic financial statements. That's considered to be an unmodified opinion, um, commonly referred to as a clean opinion. Essentially means that I believe that, that your financial statements are accurate and in accordance with our professional standards. And I do wanna point out that that is the highest level um, of assurance that you can receive as part of the audit process. The, uh, the next item there in terms of internal control, again, we consider your, your internal control structure. There is a comment there that's listed as finding 2021-1, preparation of the annual financial statements. That's something that's been re reported in the past. It's very common for districts of your size. Um, we're required to present that finding because as part of the audit process, 
we have also been the ones to prepare your financial statements. Uh, in an ideal accounting 101 type environment, the organization would prepare that and then we would come in and just purely audit that. Um, in practicality, again, what we're doing here is, is very common. We provide a service to prepare your financial statements. Uh, and again, that's the school is within your financial statements. The last item there, just want to focus on compliance. That's focusing on federal and state aid. I will talk more about this as we move through the slides, but um, certainly federal and state aid, very important to your budget, your budget process. From an audit standpoint, we perform tests of some of those programs, um, and we do issue an opinion on that. That's considered to be an unmodified opinion. And again, I'll talk more about federal and state aid as we move through the slides. So certainly all good news when you step back and look at this slide. I also want to touch briefly on information that we are required to communicate to the board as part of the audit process. Um, the bullets that are included on this slide are included in the, in the executive summary. It's a, it's a letter that's essentially labeled as required communication. It's a, it's a, standard, a standard document. The language and the content in there is fairly consistent with what you've seen in the past. I, I would say if you have any questions with regards to any of those topics, I would be more than happy to uh, to talk about those further. This bullet point list is a listing of some of those. It's not designed to be all inclusive. Um, from my perspective, I would say there's certainly nothing that is certainly nothing that's a red flag, um, nothing that's unusual. It does talk about standard information like things like accounting practices and accounting policies. It also does talk about things like audit adjustments, which I want to highlight. Um, all adjustments that I'm aware of are included in your financial statements. Again, meaning those are complete uh, and accurate in accordance with our professional standards. I'm just going to pause here. Is there any topics or um, things that you've seen on that list that you'd like me to talk further about? Any other comments so far? Okay. <coughs> and then I will keep moving ahead. I also wanted to, uh, again, highlight some of the single, single audit highlights. Uh, this is, again, focusing on your federal and state aid. From a reporting perspective, there's schedules in here on pages 84 through 87 that list the different federal and state programs. Um, that the district participates in. From a dollar's perspective, you receive approximately 14.5 million in federal funds and 94.8 million in state funds. I do want to point out there was a specific <coughs> increase in the federal funding. Um, for 2020, you received just under $10 million, so a significant increase of $4.6 million in federal funding, uh, primarily due to increases in things like child nutrition um, and then the ESSER funding due to some of the additional COVID funding resources that uh, were available. From a testing perspective, again, I just wanted to point out that we do not test every program. We go through what I'm going to refer to as a risk-based process for determining which programs we concentrate and test. Um, I listed those up on the slide here so you can see we've tested three different federal programs and four different state programs. And I really just wanted to give you perspective on this. Um, again, from a testing perspective, the federal programs that we've tested represent 6.9 million of the 14.5 million. So really we're testing less than 50% of the federal funds that you receive. I just wanted to point that out. Um, in terms of our testing, again, no issues, no concerns. I'm not aware of anything that we would need to report in terms of a reportable condition. Uh, just again, just trying to give you some perspective on what we're looking at from a compliance standpoint. Any thoughts or questions on that? Okay. And then I just wanted to move into some financial information. And the information that I'm going to show you and walk you through is information that you've seen in the past or the topics are consistent with what you've seen in the past. I'm going to focus on your fund balance reserves. That's the most common metric in terms of measuring financial performance um, and reserves. I'm also going to talk about some of your long-term liabilities, your long-term debt. Um, as well as your other post-employment benefits. I think what you'll see as we walk through the financial information, that all of the financial information I would consider to be very positive, very strong. Um, you have been in strong financial condition. You'll see as we walk through this that that certainly um, is continuing as we move forward. This slide is just focusing on your general fund and it's looking at the fund balance for that fund. Again, you can see the overall trend. Uh, your fund balance for your general fund has been increasing slightly over the last several years. The overall balance at the end of 2020 um, was approximately 49.3 million. That has increased at the end of 2021. You're at approximately 55.6, so an increase of 6.3 million. 
That is discussed, I would say, in the management discussion and analysis section of your financial statements. There's also some budgetary information in here. I would recommend that if you have not read the management discussion and analysis section of this, that you do step back and take a look at that. That does provide a narrative overview um, of the financial statements and some of the information that's in there. I just want to talk briefly on the different categories here. The category that I tend to focus on the most is the unassigned category. That's the dollars that are available. They have not been earmarked or set aside for any other purposes. Um, you can see the overall growth. You can see your trend over the last five years. And I do want to highlight, highlight from 2020 to 2021, that balance has increased to almost 34 million at the end of 2021. So certainly a strong balance there. As a reminder, the assigned and committed categories are categories that the district uses from a planning perspective. Uh, setting aside resources for specific purposes. There is additional information on your financial statements in pages 57 and 58 that detail out those purposes. I just do want to highlight as part of that the assigned category. That is really driven by the board's knowledge and board action. Uh, back in July of 2021, um, there was, a, was some action taken to uh, set aside funds for those assigned purposes. So those match up. And then I should point out that the committed funds that is primarily uh, related to the health insurance reserves and the district's health insurance program. And this next slide, again, focusing on the general fund, specifically the unassigned balance. And from a benchmarking perspective, we like to look at how much unassigned fund balance do you have in your general fund in comparison to the amount of actual expenditures within your budget. Uh, you can see the overall results here. Your trend, again, over time, is it's increased slightly, 26.2% uh, at the end of 2020 versus 26.1% at the end of 2021. Um, while I did mention your unassigned fund balance on the previous slide, you did see the dollars increase. What's happening is, is the expenditures in your budget have also increased. Thus, that percentage uh, that you see in the slide here has remained relatively flat. Uh, but the message with this is that from a benchmarking perspective, you're in very strong shape with regards to your overall fund balance. The, the general rule of thumb with regards to overall fund balance is typically 20 to 25 percent. Uh, so being at 26 percent, you're right in line with that benchmark. And again, a, a, just an indicator of being in strong financial condition. I think just to add something, Brian, I think uh, so when we look at this 26.1 uh, percent, that's, that's as of June. And then, so what we do then, that's why we come back to the board in November and we recommend those additional uh, designations so that we're within that 15 to 20% that's within the, the uh, policy of the board. So just in case you're wondering, I thought, you know, I th we've, we've thrown out, I think we're at about 18%. Well, that's after the action you took in November, so. Okay, thank you for clarifying that, Mark. And I do want to point out that when we look at the expenditures, I mean, we are combining funds 10 and 27 within your financial statements. Any other thoughts or questions on that? Okay, and then this, uh, again, just giving you a snapshot of your fund balances as of the end of, of 2021 versus 2020. Um, I'd say the highlights here are in the special revenue section, the overall increase in your food service balance. Uh, up to 1.9 million at the end of 2021. And then if we jump to the bottom, the capital projects section there, I just wanted to highlight the last line there labeled as the long-term capital projects fund. That's your fund 46, um, and you've continued to set aside additional resources within that fund, um, completing a $3 million transfer um, that was approved and effective as of June 30th, uh, 2021, bringing your balance uh, up to 5.5 million. And then I also just wanted to give you a snapshot of your long-term debt. Again, this is as of June 30th, fiscal year end. Again, you can see your overall trend um, moving back to 2017, approximately uh, 57.3 million in debt. Rolling forward to 2020, you're at approximately 45.3. And at the end of 2021, at approximately 42.5. This is just the ending balance. During the year, you did complete three, re three refinancing transactions. Uh, that's all reflected and disclosed in your financial statements on page 38. Um, and again, just wanted to give you a presentation of your actual ending balances as of June 30th. Any notes for deferred referendum? Is 
So this is all as of June 30th, 2021. Um, the debt footnote disclosures disclose the individual debt issues, the ending balances, and then we do have information with regards to the refinancing transactions that occurred. Sure, no, I'm just in the in the chart here. There's the the green was the pretty healthy section in 2017, which yeah. I'm guessing it's the referendum. Result of the uh, refunding. Gotcha. Yeah. And so they were taken out as notes, and then gotcha. now they're refunding bonds. And then I did just want to touch briefly with regards to your other post-employment benefits on uh, your Fund 73. Um, just a reminder again, you are required to have an actuary go through that process um, and value the liability. They issue an, a report on that every two years. The most recent actuarial valuation included a liability of approximately 17 million. The uh, second bullet point there focusing on your Fund 73, that trust was established in 2006 to help set aside resources and the net position or ending balance in that trust as of June 30, 2021 uh, was approximately 27 million. Those funds are required to be used for other post-employment benefits. And again, as I walk through the three topics that we, we focused on, those are kind of the three main financial metrics that, that, that districts are measured or benchmarked based on. Um, all of yours are extremely positive in terms of your overall financial condition. I'm, I'm just curious on that slide. What happens with the ten thousand dollar, ten million dollar difference there? So between the liability and the position. so, what's happened is is you've over time have changed your benefit. There, you, you at one point you had a um, a benefit that was based off helping individuals pay for the premium, right. and now you've moved over into funding HRAs. And I know the district has been focused on fully funding those HRAs. Those HRAs. Um, are assigned to the individuals and the individuals receive the benefit of, of generating interest on those funds. So it, it has helped to increase the overall balance, but everything within that fund 73 is required to be used towards uh, post-employment benefits. So, so for example, like right now, we pay people out who retire a certain amount toward purchasing their own insurance. Would the $10 million difference between our current liability and the benefit trust balance that you showed in that position, that could that be appropriated to increasing that so that people could have more money or you can't? No, that, that money's already in their accounts. So it's not, it's even though it's, it's held within this Fund 73 trust in an HRA, it's in the individual's name, meaning we can't touch it unless they, uh, if they don't, retire with the district or they're not eligible for the HRA, then the money reverts back to the trust. But that if uh, once an employee has 10 years of experience with the district, <coughs> they're allowed to invest that money in uh, different uh, variable accounts. And the stock market's done very well the last you know five, six years. And so some of those employees have made a pretty nice uh, return of investment on their balance. Um, so that's, that's one of the reasons why there's a, a surplus there, but it's not money that we can access to use to spread out to other individuals. I guess, does that answer your question, Kate? No, but I no. don't really understand. <laughs> <laughs> if, I, if, I, if I may, uh, Mark, just to, uh, and Brian, the, the $27 million uh, is, is really the, how much money is on hand within all those accounts that would fall under those HRA accounts and other post retirement benefits, meaning that would be the value of those accounts if, it w if they were all able to access. And the 17 million is really what is our, 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 what would be our liability in terms of what we would have to fund in order to, to be able to fund at the levels we said we were going to fund. Is it, is yeah, it? so I think that's a, a good way of putting it. I mean, the liability is, determined by the actuarial study of, of, and you know, it gets a little complicated how they come up with that number, but basically they're saying, you've promised them this, what's, what's, what's the cost of that over time for your current employees? And then the, the uh, net position is really, what money have we given out in the HRAs, and how has that money grown over time um, for the actual accounts? So, the money that's in those accounts is greater than the, the liability at this point. But it's not so. the district's money, it's the individual's money. 
it's the district's money, but it's in separate accounts because once they're vested in the money, it becomes theirs. It's not theirs until they're vested, but we can't legally take money, money out of their individual accounts until they would leave the district and not qualify for it to be vested. So. And once you put it in that trust, you can't take it back out. You can't, you can't put the money in and then say, oh, we want to change our mind and do something different. Once it's in there, it has to be used for those benefits. My question, because I just remember that was a, a big line item budget. <coughs> Wasn't that, what, $2 million this year? Yeah, it was. Uh, so we had uh, had $4 million in our operating budget to fund two things. One, retirees that retired before we did this, and we were still paying uh, a portion of their health insurance. So that number has, has dwindled down. There's very few that are still pre-2013 retired. And then the uh, second amount was to fund these HRAs. So we had to fund those contributions and we had to back fund, which we borrowed for, right? So, so we're down to where, uh, from an operating budget standpoint, uh, we only need $2 million now to pay for retiree health insurance and to fund um, the HRAs on an annual basis. That dropped quite a bit this year, but the the loan we took out, that principal and interest is due this year and next year. It's two years we're paying it off. And because that was non-referendum debt, that counts against um, our revenue limit budget. So even though we had a drop in the operating budget, we had an extra payment in our non-referendum debt. So they kind of cancel each other out. So when we talked earlier in finance about in two years, when that $3 million debt service drops off, that's all under the revenue cap and that's that's gonna be money that can go back into operating. But wrap my head around why do we need to budget $2 million if we've already got $10 million in surplus on yeah. our liability? Because we can't touch the money that's in the individual HRA account. So we funded, let's say we, we funded a teacher $1,000 last year, okay? They turned around and invested that in variable accounts, and they now have fifteen hundred dollars from the thousand we gave them. That's that's not money we can take back and use to fund other employees or something. That's in their HRA funds. So, and they're relying on that too. Is that liability a, a one-time liability, or is this a rolling liability, or I guess how, so how is that determined? The, the liability is calculated by an actuary. When they do that process, there's a lot of variables that go into it. It is an estimate. They look at the benefit packages that you have. They consider um, the, the terms of the benefit vesting requirements, how much you're expected to get. There's certain, and they also consider that, you know, there's gonna be people that are here and employed that never received that benefit because they might they might leave the district without being eligible for that. Um, there could be other things that happen to them that they never wind up taking out that benefit. So there's a lot of there's a lot of variables that go into that process. They do evaluate that every two years when they go through and do this full actuarial process. Um, you're required to do that. It, you're required to have that certification um, as part of that process. And we rely on that in terms of what goes into the. Well, is there a way to determine things? out of that seventeen million dollar liability how much of that seventeen million we've currently funded? Or twenty, and we're overfunded. Yeah, so we don't. So well, that no, the we're not overfunded. Those accounts did really well for those individuals. Right. Yeah. yeah, but what I'm saying is that we don't have a, a net liability anymore. Which well, but then why do we have two million dollars in the budget for it? You also have people that are continuing to earn benefits as you go, and you need to continue to keep that in your budget because they're continuing to earn yeah. benefits. And you can't take money that's in the trust to pay for it. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's just a significant well, amount of money if these yeah. accounts are properly funded already. That's, that's what I'm trying to... Yeah. Yeah. We'll always have to budget for the annual contribution to the HRA accounts every year. So I, I know that there's a lot that goes into that process and there's a lot of questions that can be raised by that. I, I guess I just wanna step back with regards to the purpose of the slide. You're following standards with regards to what you're doing with the actuarial study. You have negotiated with your employees to provide them a benefit. 
and from the district's perspective, you've been focused on getting caught up with that back funding and understanding and, and limiting the impact on your annual budget. I think you've done a fabulous job with that. And from the employee's perspective, the reason you see those large cash balances there versus the liability amount, that means that those individuals are benefiting because again, those individual balances are receiving investment earnings and they're gonna wind up with the benefit of that. So that, I just wanna step back. That was the purpose of the, of the slide. Any other thoughts or questions on that? Okay. Um, just wanted to point out too, there is information with regards to new accounting standards. Um, we will work with the district in terms of implementing those. From my perspective, accounting perspective, financial statement disclosures, the lease one, I'll say there's a little bit of work that needs to go into that one, so that is a little bit of a bigger deal. Um, from a budget standpoint, no significant changes. You just need to understand what commitments and agreements you have, and you need to make sure that you're budgeting uh, to make the payments that are required based on those agreements. So more of a technical accounting issue. And that is all I have prepared. So if anyone has any other questions, I'd be more than happy to try to answer them. And I just want to thank Wendy, too, for all the hard work she does with keeping all these grants and finances in order and your team. So It's a team effort. Yes. <laughs> it's not me. I'm just the figurehead here tonight. So. And, uh, <laughs> And I told Ryan before that you know, this would be his last presentation in this room. And I think you said you've been on the, at least on the accounting team here for over 20 years. Yeah, I'm, uh, I don't office. want to date myself here, but um, <laughs> <laughs> I've been in the profession for more than 20 years, and I, I started out as the rookie uh, on the audit, so I've been coming here ever since. So <laughs> I'll probably be going to the wrong building as part of the audit process. <laughs> I'll drive them there. Next year. Yep, I'll drive you out there. Discussion that we're not taking action. So, trying to thank you, Mark and Wendy. Thanks to you and your team for, for all your work on this. I know it's, it's not easy. So appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Wendy. Move on to miscellaneous item B. This is the <coughs> quarterly review of our strategic plan. Seth, Jake, Mark, and <coughs> Yeah, as uh, Jake and Andrew are coming to the table, Mark already had his, uh, his seat there, so he must be joining. Um, this is our second uh, report of, of the year. As you recall, we do four reports throughout the year, uh, October and uh, December. Uh, we'll come back again in March, and uh, then we'll conclude in, in June. Um, so then again, the next report will be in March. I, one of the things I'm just impressed and continually have, have, have tried to communicate with, with this group is just the work that they've done along our long-range plan with all the other um, areas that we need to, to address on a day-in and day-out basis, but maintaining that constant focus on getting these critical long-range plan items accomplished. And you'll note that all of the um, status indicators for our outcome measures are on track or have been completed um, on time. Um, there's a lot of information there in terms of the evidence and things that we've done, but I have to give kudos to Andrea, to Jake, to Mark, their teams, and then also Nicole and Sarah on, on for the last um, um, uh, communication uh, objective, and I'll, I'll be covering that this evening on their behalf, but just uh, thank you uh, ahead of time for all the work to stay focused and to work with your teams and the buildings to accomplish um, what we've accomplished thus far under these annual goals. So now that we're halfway into the school year. So I'll start with the turnover goal uh, one objectives uh, forward to, to Jake. And I'll uh, be brief and highlight and please feel free to ask questions. So goal one objective one, uh, probably the summary there is that those seven pilot schools have been trained and now their uh, role in the process is obviously to continue implementation, but also to um, work with SNI team to determine the best way to uh, work, work through this process for the next seven schools. So they'll be putting the, the training plan together and, and tweaking what they went through um, based upon their experiences for the next seven schools. Goal one, objective two, um, probably I think two things um, 
worth highlighting here. First one being that online model. So we're, we're doing an online elementary school um, or program, I should call it, this year that, that really Jason Duff and Warner are overseeing. We're going to continue um, in that format for next year. We kind of we looked at do we want to do a charter school or do we want to keep it as a program, and I think financially it makes uh, the most sense, and, and student-wise it makes the most sense to keep it a program. So we'll continue to offer that option um, in, our, in our district to families that seek it out. Um, at the elementary level, but those numbers, I think, were as high as a 120, and they kind of continue to dwindle as families become more comfortable sending their kids back with with COVID. Um, and then activity five, um, just today we met with meet and confer, and we're increasing incentives to staff who can can get uh, dual credit certified um, to a five thousand dollar stipend, and really just working with our staff to say, please, please, please. Uh, go back and get those credits and it's not a small amount of work by by any means so in order to teach those dual credit classes they have to have a master's and 18 credits in their content area that's the, the law that changed so we have um, a number of teachers that are, are going back to school and getting the 18 credits in their their content area and those are challenging courses and, and challenging things to do but really benefits our kids and then as a result we offer uh, literally thousands of, of college credits to our students at um, a reduced rate, sometimes even a free rate um, to them. So great opportunities for our kids, and we just keep trying to incentivize our staff to, <coughs> to get that credential. Uh, goal one, objective three. Um, uh, the name of the, the game here is the same thing that you've heard a couple times today, and that's staffing challenges. So. Uh, we continue to be in need of more uh, school-based therapy, school-based therapists, and Kristen and Lakeshore are doing all they can to help us. We're trying to work with Lakeland as well, um, but that's a challenge. So uh, we just continue to try to figure out partnerships in the community that we can utilize to get more therapists in our school, and um, when we can find them, we'll, we'll, we'll put them to work. And then uh, goal one, objective four, you heard about last time when we talked about report cards. And the next step there will be to have um, the high schools and the middle schools come forward and, and share their data with you. Okay. Um, our goal around district support systems, um, you'll see that we finished the RFP process uh, for the in-health Clinic that we partner with the city and county. So uh, that was for the 2022 contract year, and uh, that contract was awarded uh, to our current provider, Helix. So we're uh, happy to continue uh, working with them on the success of that clinic. Um, objective two around financial information systems. Um, so we are uh, currently meeting with the county and the city. Uh, to discuss some different options that are available to, to us to uh, complete the second lateral from our uh, fiber optic ring out to the WISCnet service. So we're hoping to uh, have that completed uh, by the end of this, this summer. And then also we're, uh, we requested some quotes to um, have Skyward do the hosted services for us to get our uh, on-site data storage done through their, their on their servers. Uh, this is really uh, just some risk management that we're taking as uh, more and more school districts are uh, finding that they're being infiltrated by ransomware and things like that. So uh, it's, it's one of our uh, big goals is to uh, lessen some of that risk by, by doing that offsite storage. Uh, objective three, uh, around our nutrition services, uh, one of the big um, upgrades will be for Warner schools as they move into this this floor and the third floor above us. Um, they will actually have a cafeteria in that new space, so the kids won't be eating in the halls anymore. They'll have a, a cafeteria, and our nutritional services team has been working with Bray on the design of that cafeteria, and uh, it's, it'll be a, a nice new cafeteria and serving experience 
for the kids there, so we're excited about that. And then objective four, uh, around our capital needs. Um, so the, the uh, Citizens Facility Advisory Committee uh, continues to meet every month. Um, uh, they'll be taking off for the month of December, but back at it in January. And I would expect that they will uh, get through that process and come to the board here uh, during the summer with a recommendation uh, for the two middle schools. And then the uh, West Side Maintenance Shed that's going up at the Horace Mann uh, campus. Um, so the foundation has been poured, the salt shed is completed, uh, the doors have been put on that shed. Right now, uh, the concrete was poured and the steel framing is going up. If you drive by there, you'll see some of the big giant beams going up. And uh, once they finish the, the roof, then they'll be working on um, electrical and plumbing in, in there. So we do expect that to be completed in, in January. Um, and then uh, the new move to the new administrative services building. So. Um, Everybody has uh, completed that move that will be in that building. So right now, there's still a lot of boxes around and uh, some clutters. So, uh, but everybody's working hard to get uh, organized there and everything's been moving along there uh, very well. And we're anxious to have the board meeting there in January and have our, our uh, open house. And then as far as the space we're vacating here, um, uh, Bray uh, spent these last few months meeting with uh, Warner uh, Schools and with uh, Jason Lederman and the Aspire program to understand their needs for these spaces. Um, draft plans have been presented by Bray and um, they're now meeting with those groups to, to tweak those plans and uh, that process will be uh, wrapping up very soon where they'll be at about a 50% design of the spaces and uh, then they will work to get some estimated cost and then have that go out to bid um, probably in February uh, with um, construction to begin right after that uh, completion um, beginning of August so that they have some time to make their moves then in space. So this room here will pretty much be exactly like you see it now because we did remodel this room not too many years ago and um, it's going to be a nice uh, large group construction space for Warner Schools. So we're excited about uh, those two programs and what they're going to be able to have compared to what, what they have now. Okay, objective five. Um, we have um, surveys out to our 17 comparable districts for teacher salary um, information as well as administrator salary information. Um, and then um, for our Y2Y program, we had our education uh, pathway meeting October 18th. Um, we're really excited that one of our students has been named a national ambassador for Educators Rising, um, and she's only a junior at North, so excited to have her um, participate in that and really, um, really take our Educator Rising to that next level and getting more involvement, and we do have more students involved. Um, this year which is great and then uh, we for providing leadership opportunities um, the um, special education staff uh, put on professional development opportunities uh, for our educational assistance um, during our fall parent teacher conferences which was very well received um, it um, you know they've been asking for additional training um, and so they had uh, several things to choose from for training that day, and um, it was really well received by the staff. So. And then uh, goal to objective six, um, the work continues on, under our external uh, brand strategy work. Uh, we are in internal work. Uh, as I said earlier, that third newsletter went out in December. Um, the other ones, uh, previous editions are archived on our on our homepage, and you can see those, uh, the link is there. Uh, we're working through a, um, a new internal communication platform. I, we shared previously that we had to make some shifts of the ability for us to really do video um, internal posting 
uh, kind of uh, that social communication as employees. Uh, we hope to roll that out uh, sometime in early 2022. Um, and then we continue with our uh, doing a variety of posts, social media, and again, using those two different hashtags, one being SASD difference and um, hashtag celebrate S SASD. Uh, so you're seeing uh, a lot of media presence with that <coughs> as we bring new, uh, make new decisions. We've got one before you tonight that was approved by the um, by the HR committee in terms of uh, you know bring coming out to the full board. But for example, talking about some potential pay increases for our employees and trying to do some other um, work. And right away, it's how do we get that out there? How do we share? How do we communicate? Um, so Nicole and Sarah worked with Andrea and uh, to really come up with a communication plan that would support getting the word out and really utilizing those social media channels as well as other. Uh, Communication. So, just an example of, of that work to really strengthen how we're sharing the positives about the SASD. So, that's uh, where we're at with the long range plan. Happy to take any questions um, regarding the, the updates tonight, and uh, we also look forward to updates come March. Questions? Thank you. Miscellaneous C is adoption of revised Board of Ed Policy 8800. Thank you. Thank you. Some patriotic ceremonies and observances. Move forward. Second. Questions? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carried. Reports of committees. Uh, commercial and instruction. Kyle. Thank you. Uh, so we move approval of item 1 and 2. A second. Uh, so the first is we've got a new textbook in place for culinary uh, uh, and home economic construction. Um, uh, well, that is good, good fit. Um, the other, we had a discussion around the SASD crisis manual, which is uh, approved and presented to the board on an annual basis per state statute. Um, had a good conversation about what had occurred in the past week at, at North and, um, you know, really more of a situation of controlling uh, this misinformation that was spreading on social media and was actually a direct threat to students, but, um, you know, what can we do to respond to that? Jake and Seth have talked about really some unprecedented steps that the administration has took to get information out to parents as quickly as possible. Obviously, there's still a lot of confusion and concern, um, perception pieces there, but, um, you know, as David noted, both North and Etude acted appropriately based on the information they had at the time and in accordance with our guidelines. And um, really the challenge here is more around the social media environment um, and how we're, you know, how we're supporting kids as we start to see it pop up after the tragedy like we saw in Michigan. But um, happy to take any questions on any of those two items. No questions. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Alex, update. You got an update on uh, a presentation on how they're utilizing the Alex program. Uh, for those who've been on the board for a couple years, know that this has come up quite a bit. Uh, you've heard this frequently. I would encourage you just to look at the presentation that uh, Eric put together. It's, it's pretty amazing how they're using the tool and the measuring and the, the way to differentiate for students. Um, I, as I said in the committee meeting, I was very, very <coughs> excited to see this because we've talked about Alex a lot and knew it was a tool and assessment and it really realized how it played out in the classroom, but some pretty exciting stuff and that was possible through some of those um, COVID dollars that we had invested to help us and support the kids as a result of the pandemic. With that, I yield. Thank you, Kyle. Human Resources Committee, Mark. I would move approval of appointments that were uh, listed in the HR agenda along Second. with uh, number three, the retirements. Second. Questions? Those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. And then I'll move approval for items number four and five because I think that, I think that they're essentially married together to begin with. And that's the uh, educational assistant pay range and the food service pay ranges. For those of us who are not in the committees, just a little background or? Well, 
and I guess Andy will feel free to jump in, but uh, the bottom line here is that uh, we were in line with paying well enough these positions comparable to other schools, but with the nature of the beast, uh, with private industry paying $15 to $20 an hour for factory line work, we're not retaining employees or getting interest to uh, for these educational assistants and uh, cooking kitchen jobs. So we needed to bump up by a couple of dollars an hour, roughly, and then increase the pay scale too for so for the people that are in place, uh, along with uh, providing a two thousand dollar signing bonus after they've worked for ninety days for us, and a one thousand uh, dollar finder's fee for employees that make a referral that pans out for us too for new employees that were essentially full-time positions for the, for the district. So that's it in a nutshell. I don't know if there's any more to it. Great description. Thank you. Questions? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 That's it for HR. Yes, I have it. Um, facilities, Recreation, and Theater Committee, Ryan. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, I move approval of items number one and two, tabulation of bids for roofing at South High School and boiler replacement at James Madison. Second. Questions? Those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you very much. Uh, item number three is for your reading pleasure only, or if you get the beacon, you can see what's what's going on in there as far as their new marketing, as far as the CRD's new marketing strategy. Um, and then items number four and five, I move approval of the STC and the CRD financial reports. Second. Any questions? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carried. And that's it. Thank you, Ron. Finance and budget committee, Marshall. <coughs> Thank you. I move approval of item number one, fund 41, item number two, statement of cash flow, item number three, revenue and expenditures, and item number four, budget revisions and transfers. Of the Any seconds. Any questions? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? I'd like to move approval of item number five, the purchase of property for house construction program. Um, this is two sites at the Stonebrook Crossing subdivision, um, lots 21 and 22 for the amount in the amount of $95,000 total for both. Second. Questions? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Item number six, I move approval of first reading of revised Board of Education Policy 6605 crowdfunding. This was just um, verbiage clarification made. Um, no, no real major policy change. Any questions? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. I move. Um, it's just a, a correction on the purchase price. That's only ninety thousand. It wasn't ninety-five. I'm correct? sorry, at ninety thousand. I was going to say forty-five right each. each. Okay. Thank you, you, Mark. For I just wanted to make sure that we passed it properly. So. Yes, ninety thousand each. Okay. Thank you. Um, I move approval of board board of education policy first reading of policy sixty-two thirty-one budget implementation. Um, this is a clarification putting, it used to say in the policy that um, the budget had to be approved in accordance to law. We just defined what that law is and that's two thirds um, vote. Nothing changed, just made it clear. Second. Any questions? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Um, I'd like to move approval. Uh, the National School Lunch Program Equipment Grant. This is for a, um, a cooling salad bar, cold food station at Horseman Junior High. Second. Any questions? Okay, not all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion And I'd like to move approval of item nine gifts um, from the Green Bay Packers Foundation, the 
amount of three thousand dollars to the Sheboygan Theater Company, Millport Sigma for North High Science Olympia, four thousand uh, dollars. Elizabeth Coffey Living Trust of nineteen ninety two to the North High Forum Exchange events in the amount of five thousand dollars, and the Sheboygan Early Bird Rotary for Red Raider Manufacturing Tech Centers, ten thousand dollars. Questions. In favor, say aye. 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 Yes, and I'm dating myself by calling horse man junior. <laughs> 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 it's late, so I apologize. It's your meeting dates, and of course, we've uh, done for December. We'll go back to 